I have to be introducing two esteemed speakers at the same time. So, uh, uh, again, my name is Bernard Siegel, Executive Director of the Regenerative Medicine Foundation and Chair of the World Stem Cell Summit. Uh, we have helped, we have received support, and this event is in association with the HealthSpan Action Coalition. The HealthSpan Action Coalition has was formed in September 2022, and there are now 70 organizations engaged, all with the aim of moving regular, regulatory systems throughout the world to keep up with innovation, to provide reimbursement, all aimed at having a healthy lifespan, a healthy lifespan. It's universal. It's not just about longevity and living on longer. And it's not just about uh, the few that might be able to afford it. It has to go to everyone. In that journey, we all have to band together in a movement. And our next speaker, Ed Hudgens, is going to speak on regulatory issues in health span. He has had a long experience as an advocate, as an educator, and as someone who has a public persona, has written more op-eds than anyone I've ever met. So he's, his background is in communication, his background is in futurism, his background is in space, he has an interest in Africa and the development of, our, uh, uh, of that continent. There's not a single aspect of public policy that he hasn't addressed in his long career. So I'm very pleased to introduce my friend and whose organization, the Human Achievement Alliance, is one of the founding members of the Healthspan Action Coalition, Ed Hudgens. Thank you. Thank you for those kind words. Um, uh, sometimes people who know a little bit about everything, they say they know not enough about it focus, but anyway, so maybe I'm spread too thin. I will let you all determine that. Okay. Uh, anyway, thank you all for coming, and thank you for those of you who are uh, listening uh, on some other medium. Uh, yeah, I'm Ed Hudgens of the Human Achievement Alliance, and I'm talking, uh, speaking today about regulatory issues and health span, and what I want to do is, first of all, sort of set what I'm going to be doing, then I want to look at the current situation, then I want to hit a couple of the regulatory issues. There's so many, but I can only do a few of them first. So anyway, first, the current situation. Now normally, up until now, basically, <clears throat> you're born, you get sick, you get treatments uh, that might work and might not uh, work. Um, your choices are restricted by governments, by regulations and the like. You argue about how to pay the bill and who's going to pay the bill. And by the way, Right now, just in the United States, depending on what statistics you use, um, the cost of health care in this country is something like $4 trillion uh, annually, and about half of that is for individuals over 55 years old, because that's where many of the uh, ailments uh, really manifest themselves. And of course, this is not even to mention lost productivity of people who are sick and who do not have good health spans. As you age, ailments become more frequent. Um, there are no cures for aging, and you die. And that's pretty much been 100% of human history. Good news is all of you know who are at this event is that is changing. Uh, the processes that constitute aging uh, have been identified and are being researched by people like Aubrey de Grey, who's here uh, today, and many, uh, many others. Um, the development and applications of exponential technology is making uh, living healthy and slowing aging a reality. But there are problems, and that is a lot of the government regulations stand between patients and cures. So uh, let's take a look at the promise of the future and what the challenges <clears throat> are. Now first I want to put it into a context because when you try to talk to somebody about these issues, everything is kind of blurry. What is all this technology doing? And I've kind of put it in like sort of five little Bio, what I call techno hacks that basically can point a direction for uh, health span, uh, health care, and longevity in the future. First of all, uh, the cost of sequencing a human genome has gone from about $100 million, not counting initial capital costs in the year 2000, down to under uh, $1,000 today. There's a couple of companies say they can do it for uh, $200. 
the cost of getting um, uh, other biometric information, epigenetic information and the like is going down as well. This is the fundamental basis for individualized health care, not for 72% of people between the age of 20 and 30 and da 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 da. That's the first uh, techno hack. The second one uh, is research and analytic tools continue to improve. Almost every day uh, you see something about a new breakthrough understanding this data. One that I liked uh, last year was an artificial intelligence algorithm. Uh, looked at uh, 10,000 uh, functional MRI scans of healthy brains and looked at 1,000 scans of brains that had either Alzheimer's, schizophrenia, and autism and seems to be able to determine in the healthy brains which ones are going to be uh, experiencing autism and some of these other ailments. Every, every day almost you see something like that. Number three, very important, is personal uh, diagnostics uh, and later implantables. Uh, Fitbits, Apple Watches, Aura Rings, um, and later implantables and nanobots are more and more able to monitor in real time everything from sleep to heart rates to, um, uh, to other heart issues. They're supposed to come out, the Apple's supposed to come out in another uh, year or so with a non-invasive glucose uh, monitor. Every day you see some new uh, breakthrough here. It's more and more people have these sorts of devices. That's the third techno hack. The fourth techno hack is real world monitoring with AI that can detect emergencies before they happen. In other words, if you're about to have a heart attack, it might well be the medics are to your door before you even know it because you're monitored by an AI that can tell uh, what is going on with your biology. There are already cases of people who uh, you know, had COVID predicted by their Apple watches two days before they manifested in any tests. I give examples of the, those sorts of things as well. Finally, you might not even reach the point where we're going to have that uh, terrible medical condition because they're going to get, people are going to use, and researchers like at this conference are going to use stem cell therapies, CAR T, CRISPR Cas9, and so forth, to head off these sorts of ailments to begin with. That's the future that we can have in the next decade to two decades, a pretty positive future. So what could go wrong? What could be in the way? What are the challenges? Well, first of all, right up at the top, data privacy uh, for data collection. That's a problem. Remember I talked about the uh, AIs that can predict certain things. What happens when you have a test that can tell which babies potentially get Alzheimer's or potentially get some other ailment, right? Uh, how do you treat that? Um, uh, what do you do with that data? Um, or for that matter, the other thing is a lot of people, and I've talked to people, and I've looked at surveys and so forth, are concerned about data privacy, uh, about their data, their health data getting out. And one of the big challenges we have, especially in the United States today, and I suspect other places, is politicizing uh, these sorts of issues. I like to say, take the politician in the United States you loathe the most. Maybe it's Joe Biden. Maybe it's Donald Trump. Doesn't matter who it is. Pick the one you don't like, and then imagine that person controlling your health care data. Okay? And that would make, that makes my point. You really have to have this depoliticized. This is not a political matter to be manipulated by governments. It's something that's a very personal. Second uh, regulatory challenge, and this is one of the big ones, is insurance. How do you pay for this when uh, an insurance company, or for that matter, the government, if it's government uh, uh, funded healthcare, as is in many, company, uh, many countries, uh, can basically take a look at your data, and even if you leave out pre-existing conditions, uh, lifestyle has a lot to do with your health. What you do as a young person and as a middle-aged person determines your health situation in the future. So uh, how do you handle that when it can be monitored in real time by either the health insurance company or if it's a government that runs the health insurance? How do you deal with that? Well, one way is for insurance companies, or again, if it's the government, government, basically charging depending on what your lifestyle is. So if I jog every day, I do by the way, and if I'm a healthy guy and I eat well and so forth, I get a discount on my insurance. And by the way, I do get a small discount because I sh share my information with the, with the insurer. That's cool, okay? But what about the 60% of Americans who are overweight or obese? What about them? Do they get charged two times, three times, four times as much? Would that be politically viable? That's a challenge, okay? Well, what are some of the other models here? Well, 
Medicare, Medicaid, and in the United States, uh, state insurance regulations uh, could set more equitable rates, meaning, well, we don't want to penalize people for their uh, lifestyles. That can be a problem, too, because if you set something that's more flat rate, maybe you, you, know, maybe you leave out if you're smoking, you do get a higher rate and so forth, then that can be a problem because people who exercise and so forth, even though I think health is a good thing in and of itself and health span is a good thing in and of itself, you can, uh, you can imagine people saying, wait a minute, I don't want you to take away my, uh, uh, I don't want you to, uh, you know, penalize me for my uh, lifestyle. In New York City, just about a week ago, they banned discrimination, what they call fat discrimination. Now, right now, it applies to employment and some other things, but I can see where it's going to possibly affect um, insurance, which often goes through a business. So if somebody is overweight, well, you can't discriminate against them. Right now, it probably doesn't make a big difference, but what happens in the future? Um, by the way, just a, on a personal note, my, my sister in uh, the year uh, 2009 uh, passed away because she was morbidly obese and had diabetes. And we tried to help her. She got the stomach stapling. She was losing weight. It was too little too late. So when people say, oh, being obese, it's just a health care choice. Well, I beg to differ. You know, it's something that is a terrible thing. It, you know, it cost my family. Uh, it's not healthy. And if you want to talk about the public good, okay, it means a lot of people are going to end up paying for you and for your lifestyle. So how do you handle that? And again, equitable rates, that has a problem too. Um, another thing is that you already have problems with their boutique insurance companies or, or health, span, health span companies. Uh, uh, Fountain Life in Florida is a good example where they will look at your genome and they will tailor treatments for you. Now this is wonderful, okay? This is exactly what we want in the future, uh, to have treatments tailored for you. The problem is that, um, uh, that, for example, you can't use Medicare money for these, uh, uh, for these uh, uh, boutique treatment uh, 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 companies. And so, and you already have re other regulations that are problems. For example, um, the, uh, 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 was it, um, uh, Life Extension in Florida, also in Florida, has an algorithm that if you do a blood test, they look at, the, look, look at all the results, they run it through their algorithm, and they tell you what your biological age is compared to your chronological age. And so I wanted to take the test, but I'm a resident of the state of Maryland. And it's illegal in the state of Maryland for me to go into a, a lab core and get a blood test and have it sent, the results sent to Florida for them to evaluate it. So I was a healthcare criminal. I went to Virginia. I lied about where I lived. And I got, took the test in Virginia. And by the way, I'm 12 years younger biologically than I am chronologically, so yay me. But the point is, the point is that it was illegal in the state of Maryland for me to do this. So you have these kinds of things that get in the way of private companies doing good stuff. Number four, you can, of course, have the government decide we're going to micromanage your um, health care. Okay? So we are going to ban Ed from cooking his incredible pit cells. I'm a part Italian. I do incredible pit cells. But wait a minute, it's got sugar in it. And you know, you're a little bit overweight now. So sorry, Christmas is canceled. Um, you, you know, uh, yes, you can eat your broccoli and you can eat your spinach, but that's about it. Do you want the government micromanaging your diet? Are you going to basically be standing up in front of the big screen doing exercises every morning to Big Brother, like in the beginning of 1984? Um, and if you look at a lot of the mistakes the government has made in um, uh, some of their uh, mandates and so forth, that's a problem too. So this whole insurance thing and how it's regulated is going to be a major problem we have to face in the uh, future. Um, and I want to remind everybody that right now uh, in the United States it costs uh, $2 trillion approximately for the uh, elderly um, for health span treatments, uh, about $4 trillion. We're talking about a lot of money and I do see an opportunity there of setting up a system that rewards people for being healthy um, and of course for rewards companies and businesses for using these new technologies. That's a big challenge. I'm not going to give you my solution right now. I want to leave it open a little bit because I don't want to dictate. I don't claim to know everything. A couple of other challenges are the Food and Drug Administration. Now, to give you a little bit of background, we heard uh, Peter Marks uh, talk today. I've uh, seen him at other events. Food and Drug Administration was set up in the United States in 1962 uh, to certify the safety and efficacy of uh, products. 
um, but has struggled to keep up with the biotech revolution. Now, the FDA is a bureaucracy of 18,000 uh, employees. It's very unwieldy. And the incentives, certainly in the past, has been to be overly cautious. Uh, in the late 1980s, there was a famous headline um, in the Wall Street Journal that said 100,000 killed. And it specifically referred to the fact that beta blockers that could be used for people who are about to have a heart attack or having a heart attack were available in the UK, but not available in the United States because, well, there's a microscopic chance of them giving, having, giving someone cancer. But yeah, if you're dying from a heart attack, it's probably not your, uh, the most important thing on your mind. And I could give other examples where something that was available overseas and saved lives was not available in the United States because the FDA institutionally has to be cautious because if you have a treatment that works for a thousand people and three people get sick and have adverse reactions, Congress is going to say, look, these are ter this is terrible. Why did you put this on the market to begin with? Um, and that's a problem. Uh, small innovative companies often can't get through the, uh, the cost, which by the way, uh, uh, the uh, Tufts study found the cost is about $3 billion to bring something from researcher to patient, 10 to 12 year cost. I've heard a lot of higher numbers in this uh, conference. Uh, small innovators obviously can't, often can't afford it. Innovators are driven offshore, and we probably know all good examples of sound innovators, not snake oil salesmen, who are driven offshore, and of course, there's a lot of suffering in their invisible graveyards of people who couldn't get the, uh, the uh, treatment because it was in uh, trials, and that is a big problem. So I'm going to offer a lot of ideas for reforms. I'm going to talk about one right now. That's the so-called free-to-choose medicine approach. It uh, was introduced last year in the U.S. Congress as the Promising, pa Promising Pathway Act. It's going to be reintroduced again this year. It's based on a 1992 AIDS parallel track when people had AIDS uh, back uh, decades ago, uh, and the FDA said, well, hey, we might have something in three or four years. A lot of the AIDS patients said, we don't have three or four years. We need it like now. And so it only t it took them two years, by the way, after public comments to set up this parallel track. But what it said is that once a product uh, treatment has been, uh, give, has been has passed phase one safety test and is in phase two, uh, the manufacturer can open it to all comers. And about 12 thousand people during the three years that this particular product was in um, uh, phase two and phase three trials accessed that product and probably had their lives saved. And the model is used for the free to choose medicine approach, the promising pathway approach, where you set this approach up for basically all treatments for serious um, ailments. Uh, and uh, basically uh, a sponsor can offer the, uh, uh, the treatment uh, after it's passed phase one safety uh, tri uh, trials or safety tests and at least one phase two safety or efficacy trial. They can offer it if they want to. And there are a lot of benefits of, uh, and by the way, the, the information, the patient information will be logged in a database that is open to the researchers. Um, so now you're getting real world information coming in. The companies, this is very important, the companies could charge when I talk to a lot of the companies and say, why don't you open up these, uh, uh, these trials, they say, well, it's costly. You know, we've got, to keep, we've, we've got to keep our standards up and this sort of thing. It's very costly. If they're allowed to charge, they'd have an incentive to charge a very small amount because they want to collect that data. Because as you'll see in a minute, that data means you can get your product approved quicker or if it's not very eff effective, you can knock it out quicker. They have an incentive to get data and to get real world data quicker. And insurance companies might well cover that cost because, hey, if something is very promising you know, and can head off really expensive costs in the future, well, um, maybe that's something we should cover. Uh, the advantages of this, obviously, is it's an incentive for patients to provide the data. Remember that whole problem of people are uh, reluctant to share their data? Well, this is, an, this is something where, in a sense, yes, if I go in there, I share my data, and I get the benefit of a new uh, 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 possibly very effective uh, product. The real world um, diverse data coming in is going to allow for certification quicker potentially or weed out the bad stuff. Again, it's real world data. I could give citations from uh, academic journals that say, well, you know, uh, clinical trials are still the gold standard, but, and when we look at artificial intelligence and the discussions that we have had today, we see that it's moving even quicker than before. Um, I'll say something nice about the FDA in just a minute, by the way. Um, 
it can obviously cut costs, so instead of two to three billion dollars uh, in 10 to 12 years, you can cut costs and time, creates incentive for innovative ways uh, as alternatives to the traditional way of doing things. In other words, not just innovation in products and treatments, but innovation in ways to certify the safety and efficacy of products and treatments. And I'll say something nice about the FDA uh, uh, right now, is that at the, at the end of last year, the FDA Modernization Act 2.0 removed the requirement for animal testing. Didn't ban animal testing, but it removed the requirement meaning that in, in silico testing now can be used as a substitute. And so this is opening up things and this is a very good thing. And FDA finally came out, I think it was in 2020, 2021, sorry, with their guidelines of artificial intelligence and how it can be used for uh, treatments. It only took them like three years to do it, but okay, fine, they finally came out with it. Um, and of course, patient access is crucial, meaning I've seen enough cases and talked to enough people who said, yes, well, my daughter died because she couldn't get into one of these trials and they, they approved the thing a few months later. So patient access is very important. So uh, th this is one of the ideas, this is, sorry, back to there. This is one of the ideas that I think is a very good idea and I've been working on this. There are other versions of, 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 uh, of uh, reforms as well. The final thing I want to mention is um, as we're looking at longevity and health span, biomarkers and endpoints are going to become more and more important. As you know, right now, it, and up until now, if you go before the FDA and say, I have a treatment for aging, well, what is that? If I say I have a treatment for cancer, we can do a, a, a clinical trial, we can have you know placebo group and so forth. but. What is aging? Well, it's a mitochondrial mutation, it's telomere shortening, it's uh, toxic zombie cells, it's stem cell exhaustions, all of these sorts of things. FDA is not used to dealing with that sort of thing. And because we're talking about something in the future, right, we're not talking about, oh, well, we did this thing and five, three months later your cancer is gone or it's in remission. When you're talking about heading off something that's going to be 10 years, 20 years, 30 years in the future, how do you make those determinations if you're the Food and Drug Administration? Right now, they really don't have a good way of doing that. But as we saw, you're talking about, what, $4 trillion of cost to say nothing about lost productivity uh, in this country. So there's certainly an incentive, and most of that is from ailments that come later in life. There's certainly an incentive to head off cancers, Alzheimer's, and so forth before they occur. My, my mom passed away about a week or so ago from Alzheimer's. and. She was 91, and that was good that she lasted that long. But, you know, if we had known 20, 30, 40 years ago ways to head that off with these treatments, that certainly would have been better. Um, so what we need to do is really uh, work on those standards. And there are a couple of companies now, or groups now, that are actually looking to, uh, to develop those um, endpoints and those biomarkers so that the FDA can actually look at these things because up till recently they wouldn't even look at someone who said I'm going to deal with mitochondrial mutation or telomere shortening or whatever. And I think it's important to let researchers, let researchers themselves basically try to come up with the um, standards and then let the FDA say yeah they look good to us and really open it up to the people who are actually doing the research. So I want to end by saying you know uh, we are at a time in human history that certainly is as consequential as the Industrial Revolution, if not more. Uh, we can increase uh, health span and lifespan. Uh, and even more important to me, in a sense, is uh, we can create a culture, um, a revolutionary culture based on optimism, based on the value of long, healthy lives and opportunities for everyone to flourish. We're in a world today that historians are going to look and say, what a bizarre time. Uh, you know, we had these incredible technologies, and yet everyone, we had, the culture is very pessimistic. Everything is going to hell. We're polarized. Certainly, you want to talk about life and death, and you want to talk about health and longevity and health span. We are at the point where we can do that. And so part of my work is to advocate both for these reforms and to change the culture. And I like to say, if anyone's interested, please approach me or go to uh, humanachievementalliance.org for those of you who might be watching on camera and contact me because I'm doing a lot of work in Washington and with media and so forth on this. 
and this is the revolution. You know, we're the leaders, so let's do it. I want to see, by the way, those are my twins, and they're going on. I want them to go on to a couple hundred. That's why I've got to live to a couple hundred. So thank you very much. I think we have time for a few questions. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay. Let me uh, start back there. Yeah, go ahead. You speak up a little bit. It's hard to. Yes. Um, we recently filmed a, a documentary and we talked about the human rights violation of the da extraction of data, the exploitive extraction of data, and came across that, that this is actually a human rights violation. So you're, you talk about data privacy and like, I'm just wondering what you think about data sovereignty, being able to advocate, like I should be able to have a wallet that I can store my data in so that I can decide if I want to donate it to a foundation for Research. Right. Yeah, the question is uh, concerning data privacy and data sovereignty. In other words, should you own your data? Should you literally have it in a wallet? So you choose whether or not to share it. Well, the uh, first thing is that massive data is going to be needed in order to, uh, to have the revolution that we're talking about. Uh, that's just a fact, and a lot of the examples I can give are based on exactly that. On the other hand, you're right about this. I think we still have to sort that out. My tendency is to say you own your data, but we want to create a system that gives incentives for you to share it. So, for example, if you're sick and you want to get one of these, uh, 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 you know, treatments that are still in phase two uh, uh, trials, well, you got to share your data. By the way, with your with your identity scrubbed, of course, or um, if you want a lower insurance rate, yeah. To donate your data? Yeah, so it's not just to be able to have oh. access to a treatment or something. That's something you, know, if you can't afford it, you're able to donate. Like uh, that's, yeah, the question is what about donating your data if you can't afford it? And uh, yeah, I mean, I'm open to all sorts of uh, uh, approaches. And part of what I'm doing here is saying, let a thousand flowers bloom, so to speak. I mean, I consider myself a libertarian, but I'm a practical libertarian. And so, yeah, you try that approach. And as long as it's not going to be dictated where, uh, you know, a company or a government or whatever is dictating it, then, yeah, they might give it a try. I think you had a question back there. Uh, yeah, you mentioned a $4 trillion expense. What was that that? Yeah, that was a $4 trillion expense for all health care costs in the United States for any given year. And I've got a citation somewhere for that if you need. I've seen, by the way, I've seen numbers lower and higher depending on what you include in health care. But the thing is, it is a really big expense. I mean, if you, if you, if you talk about just direct um, treatment, then the, the number is lower. Um, but then there's a lot of ancillary things that are going on. Um, so it depends on, where, on how you actually measure it. But it, the point is, it's a really huge amount. It's not minuscule. It's becoming one of the biggest uh, uh, parts of the, you know, any budget, whether it's a government budget, in the case of governments, uh, they run health care. Uh, some other questions? I'll go on the back there. Um, um, yeah, David. Great talk, uh, Ed. Mm -hmm. About the free to use medicine pathway. Mm -hmm. I don't know much about it, but I have seen people, some people be worried about it yeah. mm -hmm. because they say that there are some treatments that should never be approved mm -hmm. and they, the people who are providing these treatments are encouraging their uh, possible patients to say, hey, can I pay to use this mechanism and uh -huh. pay, pay us some money and uh, we'll give you this treatment. Right. Is, that a, is that a serious thing or is that being blown out of proportion? Right. Well, not yet. Yeah, the question concerns um, if, what about companies that are basically kind of trying to push, try our treatment, uh, you know, paying money for it and so forth. Well, as I say, the first thing is that, the, that in this model, uh, your product already has to have passed phase one safety uh, 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 tests and at least one phase two uh, efficacy trial. So you can't just come in and say, I'm going to do this and uh, uh, put it on that way. The uh, companies make the choice, and in some cases I suspect they won't. It's not mandating that the companies do it. It's not mandating that they charge anything. I think what I, by the way, Japan instituted something like this, I think it was six years ago, uh, mainly for their elderly, because uh, for treatments of, of you know, uh, some of the elder uh, uh, ailments, because it's the aging society and they, they really need to do that. Now, I'll be honest, I have not looked in the last couple of years how that reform has gone. 
I know there were some problems with it to begin with because there were some bad actors and they had to do some things to, uh, to tighten that uh, up. Um, uh, but yeah, it's, a, it's, it's an issue to be looked at. As I say, they did do that for the AIDS uh, 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 situation. It probably saved about 12,000 uh, lives. Yeah. were very concerned about that legislation because they did think there was an interference between the patient-clinician relationship and that the, the problem really is about educating clinicians about compassionate use because most companies, if, if somebody is asking for compassionate use, it's like a 98% approval rate anytime a clinician asks for compassionate use for a patient. But people weren't knowing to ask. And so then there was concern that we're leaping to another solution that could have negative implications yeah. without first doing this clear yeah. oh, By the way, uh, the, the, this is a question about compassion to use and some of the conflicts that we might have. And by the way, um, uh, part of the legislation that, you know, at least is going to be reintroduced, I've read it, uh, I, it, it needs amendments, by the way, but that's another issue, is that um, uh, you do this in uh, consultation with your physician. So you do have to have a physician saying, yeah, we've talked to this person, we've looked at where they are, and so forth and so on, and we think this is something they would, that this treatment's in phase two is something that would be useful. So they do have some checks in there about that. And again, if there's other series of other uh, issues, I say, well, yeah, you tweak the legislation. I tried to put in the legislation last year that it would cover the, um, um, the processes that constitute aging, okay? It was taken out because apparently some members of Congress thought that was too controversial. We have one of the oldest Congresses in <laughs> our history. All of these folks are like 70 or 80. You think just self-preservation you know, would have them uh, uh, you know, enthusiastic about this. But seriously, one of the problems is education. When you talk about these things, they're just, you know, I mean, they're ignorant. I'm not saying they're ignorant in the sense that they're just stupid people. Some probably are. but. Uh, you know, they just don't know. If I talk about what is mitochondrial DNA, what is a telomere, what is stem cell uh, uh, treatments and all, they just don't even have the vocabulary. And you see the same thing in a lot of the public policy communities in Washington. And one of the things I'm doing is I'm forming a um, working group uh, with other experts in D.C. to first of all educate, to raise their consciousness, to say this is what is coming, what I just presented to you folks in the next five to 10 years with technology, we had better be on the cutting edge, understanding this stuff, looking for the solution so that we get the best outcomes so we don't want some kind of a, a 1984 situation or whatever. And that's part of what I'm doing. Got one more question in the back. And Something that goes below the radar screen, 
and that basically um, uh, you know creates a revolution, just like you know the people who created you know I don't have my iPhone. Where's where's my iPhone? Somewhere here. Anyway, you know I mean the people who created that revolution, they were working in their garages, right? You know they weren't regulated. They didn't have OSHA coming in. They didn't have all the government agencies coming in. And guess what they did? Uh, it's a little bit different with uh, these things, with you know, curing cancers, heading off Alzheimer's, and so forth, and really in, in, uh, doing, dealing with the health span. But I think you're right. And that's one of the things, in fact, that I'm going to be working with some of the folks in Washington, because a lot of them are what I call libertarians, conservatives, but reasonable ones. They're not you know, wackos or something, who are looking for these ways that can you get around the current system. And I can, we've had a couple of talks here already. Um, um, about exactly this. I get one more question, then we'll come over time a little bit. But so, so currently, the world looks at uh, cancer, heart disease, and diabetes as the biggest expense. Yep. There between 193, 108, and 825 billion. Yep. However, osteoporosis is five to 6.5 trillion annually mm -hmm. between U.S., Canada, and Europe. As the the compound effect of the last two years of COVID, still, how do you see that impacting the world of health and the global economic system? Okay, so basically you said that osteoporosis is one of the even more costly ones than some of these others. It, and it's it's um, yeah. 500% more than anything else, and it's not looked upon as a big expense. Well, it seems like it obviously is a big expense. And uh, I think that those who are paying for it, in some cases it's governments, in some cases uh, insurance companies regulated by the government, whether states or locals. Uh, yeah, and again, it's raising consciousness about these things. And that's why I emphasized sort of lifestyle um, as one of the things that we have to look at. I don't want to dictate to anybody. Um, but yeah, this is, and by the way, just what you're, what you're saying here, I'm not an anarchist, so for those of you listening, no, I'm not an anarchist, even though you might think I am. But, um, you know, but the thing is, governments make mistakes. And so, I, and I can, I can give you lots of examples, of not only the FDA, but with others, about where they make mistakes, which is where we have to come in and say, hey guys, you're missing something. You know, you know, uh, obviously, cardio is a big one. Diabetes is a big one. You mentioned the three that were the biggies, right? But there are other things that you guys are missing. Yeah, that's part of what we have to do in terms of education. And that's what's happening, by the way, as I mentioned, with Alzheimer's, um, because we have an aging population. You know, 50 years ago, not many people got Alzheimer's because they never reached the age where it kicks in. Now it does. Okay, uh, I, yeah, we went over a little bit, but that's okay. Anyone who's interested, I've got some copies of. Um, a few uh, handouts here, and anyone who's listening, feel free to contact me because it's a revolution. It, we're in the most optimistic time in human history, but we have to make it. We have to be the human achievers. So thank you very much for coming.